Being a pastor is a strange vocation. When I tell people that I'm a pastor, and I usually don't lead with that because it makes people feel very, very uncomfortable, a frequent question is, is that all you do? (laughs) There is a genuine impression out there in the general public that a pastor works one day a week. And if that's true, this is it. Here we are. It's happening right now. And half a shift at that, not even a full day. Imagine the audacity. And sometimes people ask what that's like and what that's about. And this is not unique to pastors. This is true, I suppose, of all adults, and especially for those who have adult children, maybe also aging parents. One of the exciting things about being a pastor is you never know who's going to call and what they might say. Because I'm the knucklehead who gives his cell phone out very, very freely. If you don't have my cell phone, meet me right after church, and I'll give it to you. I've got a pocket full of business cards. I'd love uh, to connect with you and get acquainted, help you meet some cool people here in our church. Sometimes I consider myself a church concierge, okay? I just like to help people make connections, find their spot in God's family, serve the way God wants them to do. But because I give my phone out to so many people, I don't know who might call. I'm the guy that picks up to hear the car warranty call because very often people call from numbers that I don't have yet. And then there's, of course, the people who call frequently because they're in one of those dark valleys and they're going through a genuinely tough time. With those folks, sometimes I know that they might be crying before they start speaking. And I hate that those calls have to be made, but I welcome them because it's my privilege as a Christian, as their brother in Christ, their pastor, to hear those stories and go with them through those moments. So a couple of weeks ago, someone who's a dear friend here in the church actually called. And as I sometimes do when I know it's one of those families, one of those individuals that's going through the very hard time, I, it's pretty amazing. I'd like to have the medical data on it. I can feel the adrenaline surge. I can feel my heart start to race. And what I generally do is take one big deep breath, say a little prayer for them and myself, and then pick up wondering what it might be if they're going through a hard time. And so my buddy called. And what he wanted to know this time, in the middle of all of his troubles, was where the best tacos were in Huntington Beach, California. (laughs) And I thought to myself when that conversation was over, because I had, of course, a recommendation, and in the 21st century style, he sent me a picture of his empty plate saying, look at the aftermath, this is what we've done, where you told us to go. And I thought to myself, what kind of reputation have I developed for myself (laughs) all those years in seminary? And the question I so frequently get is tacos. Well, the answer is pretty evident, right? Why you should, you you can follow me around knowing that we will be eating something good soon. And I had a recommendation. In fact, I had a couple. And that got me thinking because my mind runs along on the most trivial things and I can start thinking about them and relating them to things that are much more important in life and found in the Bible. And it made me wonder why he would call me, why I was so excited to tell him, why he was so excited to share with me a picture of his finished meal. You know why? Because people love to talk about the things they love. It's natural. When you discover something or someone amazing, when you have a great experience, when your kid does something wonderful, you tell people. It's love that does it. If you've been around this church for any amount of time, you know that I talk about my kids a great deal. There's a reason for that. I love them. I'm very, very proud of both of our sons. I know some of you are sick and tired about hearing about my sons, but I've only got two. I love them with all my heart, and these are the stories you're going to hear as long as I'm around. That's how love works except when it matters most. 
because the one we should love the very most is the one we've been singing about and celebrating through things like communion and giving all morning. We've been talking about Jesus, the very center of our lives, the ones who, according to Scripture, if you believe the Bible, you've been singing and you believe with all of your heart what you've just been singing, that Jesus, the eternal uncreated Son of God, for love of you, stepped into human history, lived a life to obey God in a way that you simply did not, would not, and could not died on a cross for your sins, not his own, because he had none. And then, as promised by Scripture, across 1,400 years in three different languages, this book tells you of the Savior to come, it tells you of the the Savior's appearing, and it promises the Lord himself promises his return to keep every promise that God graciously ever made you all of that is true of you if you are a Christian. Is any of this making sense to Crosspoint this morning? That's our life. That's our Savior. That's our Lord. And the convicting question, at least for me, is if He's that awesome, and I owe Him that much, and I love Him so much, why doesn't He come up more often in daily conversation? Why don't I share as much about Him with as many people as I meet as I do about something that is good but far less important? And listen, there's no guilt trip here. Whatever you're into, your kids, your grandkids, your hobbies, for you it's pasta, maybe it's something that you, some craft that you've developed, something you can make with your hands and stand back and be proud of and post on Instagram and everybody tell you how brilliant you are. All of those are good gifts from God. Enjoy them to the hill. See God's goodness and make sure your mind runs right back up from the gift of the giver and thank Him and enjoy Him and enjoy that gift as much as you possibly can. But remember, if we truly believe who Jesus is and what He has done for us, for the vast majority of us, there should be much more conversation, much more sharing, much more excitement about Him than about all of those other things combined. On the doorstep of Friend Day, where we're going to ask you and invite you prayerfully and challenge you to bring friends to church with you on September 18 so they can hear the gospel, let me share a different kind of sermon and just remind you by looking at the words of Jesus himself and tell you why we should tell people about Jesus. We begin in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, you'll notice, is the last few words in Matthew's gospel. Matthew 28, and I'm reading from verse 16. It's in your bulletin as well. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Here's the setting if you're not familiar. Jesus has already died on the cross. He's risen from the dead. In many ways, He's given repeated proof of who He is. They're familiar, they are acquainted with the fact that the Lord has kept His promise. They have the miracle of a man who was killed by the Roman soldiers on a Roman cross. He now stands before them, and notice He's in charge. He told them to return to Galilee, where many of them were from, a country, a region of Israel of no particular importance to people in what they thought were more cosmopolitan areas. Galilee basically fed the nation. Many of the disciples came from those working class roots. Now Jesus wants to meet with them on a mountain. He's in charge. He's directing them. And verse 17 says, when they saw him, they worshiped him. But what's it say? Some doubt it. One of the many evidences of the truthfulness of the Bible is the Bible always tells you about the disciples of Jesus as they actually were. It never hides their faults. Matthew was in this group. I would imagine that Matthew refers to the doubts in the hearts of some of the disciples around Jesus because Matthew was one of the doubters. I don't know how else, humanly speaking, he would know. He can see that many are worshiping. He is conscious also of the doubts in the hearts of some of them, maybe in his own heart. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And that's the way it's always going to be when Jesus commands us to do something. 
When Jesus tells you to do something, you will always stand at the crossroads between doubting Him and worshiping Him. And if you will worship Him, you will obey Him. If you will not, you will merely doubt Him and disobey Him. And Jesus came and said to them, Listen to this, the full authority of the Son of God become a man now risen from the dead. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Wow. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. To Bible students, it might even be printed in your Bible by the human editors who put these English words on paper. This section is known as the Great Commission. This is one of five times that it appears in the New Testament. In every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also in the book of Acts that follows that was written by Luke, who also gave us his gospel, we hear Jesus five different times, five different ways, with five different choices of words, telling his disciples to share the good news and to make disciples. For those of you who like to dig in a little deeper into the language of the Bible, the only imperative in this passage in the Greek in which Matthew wrote it is to make disciples. The going is necessary, but it sounds more like this. As you are going, going, make disciples. In other words, the going is mandatory only because this good news has to spread, according to Jesus, from a mountaintop in Israel to all the nations. But the going is not the point. Speaking as a former missionary and the son of missionaries, sometimes with very young missionaries, I get a sense that they're way more excited about the adventure of travel than they are about the disciple-making. And I get that. I've been there. I've done that. I've been that person. But the imperative, the commandment, the center of this passage is to make disciples. In other words, what I'm telling you is the reason we need to share this good news is because Jesus told us to do so. And that should be enough. If He is Lord and Savior, if He has all authority, if He rules heaven and earth, and in His loving authority, He rescues sinners and turns them into His brothers and sisters, placing us in the family of God, if He said so, that should be sufficient. We need to talk about Jesus. We need to share the good news because Jesus told us to do so. And I want you to think of the great commandment as the great commission rather as broadly as you can. In other words, it's very unlikely that many of you will ever be in front of a church body with an open Bible under bright lights as I am right now. That's probably not your role. That's probably not something you're called or gifted to do. But can you send a text message? In casual conversations with people you care about, can you redirect the topic to Jesus? When someone is struggling with something and telling you about their difficulties in life, rather than offer your best human perspective and advice, can you say something like, you know, something I read in my Bible a couple of weeks ago comes to mind when you mention those problems. Can I share that with you? That's what I do. I bring up Jesus. I mention the Bible. I mention something that I learned studying for a sermon. And then, many times, just out of human politeness, I say, can I share that with you? And if they say, no, don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear a word. Well, then I'm done. I can be a respectful person. But why not bring up his name? Why not mention the good news? Why not raise Him as the answer? And then, most people, with all the different things we could do to bring the good news, to bring Jesus' name up, to bring His claims up in front of people, you can mail a book. You can send a text. You can make a phone call. You can write a letter. You can send a YouTube link to a three-minute truth of the Bible that you found transformational and helpful. You can send that to him and then later engage the conversation and 
See if they'll lie to you and say, did you re watch the video I sent you? Oh, well, uh, okay, but at least now we're talking. The number one reason Christians don't mention the gospel and don't share the good news, according to every survey I've ever read, is because people say, I'm afraid they'll ask me a question I can't answer. Is that relatable? You share that fear? That fear is real. That fear is real for me. I deal with it every week. You're an inquisitive bunch, and almost every week, at least one of you sends me a hard Bible question. Happened this week from the book of Revelation. And I sent an answer to one of the most cryptic things in the book of Revelation, saying there's a lot of theories. Here's what I think this teaches. Would you like the study materials that come along so that you can make up your own mind? Absolutely, Pastor. Please send those back to me. So I did. No problem. Let me help you recalibrate your thinking on bringing up the good news that Jesus is, the good news that Jesus announces, and give you a different thought on what to do if somebody asks you a question you can't answer. Here's all you say. That is a really great question. I don't know. But can I investigate and get back to you? They'll say, okay. And guess what? Now you've got an ongoing conversation about Jesus. You can call me. You can call somebody else. You can do your own research. And you can reach back to the person and say, I've got a pretty good answer to that hard question you asked me. Can we talk about that now? And now there's an ongoing conversation, not about the trivial things that will be taken from us in death, from this beautiful life that we enjoy. You're talking about eternal life himself. You're talking about Jesus. Here's the truth of the matter. It really isn't a matter of knowledge. I'm convinced it's a matter of love. Because the heart that is obeying Jesus is also loving Jesus. Look in John 14, verse 15. It's printed on your bulletin. Jesus said this, read it with me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do you memorize Scripture? You can. You can take this one home, learn by heart right now. It's one of the most important things that Jesus ever said. Notice that this is John 14. This is in one of the most famous passages in John's Gospel. I'm going to read the earlier section of it to you in just a minute. This takes place right before Jesus is arrested. These are His final words to His disciples. The traitor has gone out to betray Jesus. Jesus has a matter of hours left with his disciples and he's instructing at the very end with a clarity and a depth and a passion that is unmatched in all of his ministry and he makes it really, really simple. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now that's a hard, fog-cutting kind of verse for me because that tells me if I'm not obeying Jesus, what is usually lacking is not knowledge, it's love. Love for Him. If I actually love Him, I will do my best with what I already know to obey Him. If He told me to pray, I will pray as best I know how. If He told me to give, I will give as much as I dare. If He told me to serve, I will sometimes go out scared to death, thinking that I'll fail others and that I'll fail Him. But He told me to serve, so out of love for Him, I will go and do it. If we love Jesus, we will keep His commandment to make disciples for Jesus. Because the normal Christian life is to grow up to be a disciple who makes disciples. I need you to understand that and I'm pleading with you to believe it. We've so professionalized the Christian faith in the West, in the United States in particular, where you can go to graduate school to study the Bible. There are some in this church that even have a doctoral degree in biblically related matters. That's created an illusion a disappointing, disheartening illusion that speaking of the faith and leading in the faith is the domain of the professional, of those who were called, gifted, supported to get to that level. 
The New Testament doesn't know anything about that. The New Testament, if you read your New Testament carefully, what you find is simple, ordinary, sinful people who met a risen, living, loving Savior who found themselves to their never-ending amazement, forgiven and loved by God Himself, who were so very excited about it that they couldn't help but tell other people. And they were often rejected for their witness to Christ. That's the second thing, or perhaps the quietly number one thing. If I bring him up, I'm afraid they'll shut me down. Here's some news. They will. Here's some more news. Who cares? It's good news. The good news doesn't change whether anyone believes it or not. Good, true news is good news. If it is not received in that moment, that's not your responsibility. That's between them and God. It may simply not be their time. Many years ago, a professor I love and admire and who taught me a great deal wrote a book way back in the dark ages, in the late 1900s, meaning in the, in the 90s. It's a sobering phrase, isn't it? The late 1900s makes you feel old. I heard a 20-something-year-old kid say in the late 1900s and just immediately felt like dying right there. Uh, <laughs> the late 1900s. Holy moly, I was a grown man in the late 1900s. That's a terrifying turn of phrase. In the 90s, this professor wrote a book saying that the average person in the 90s heard the gospel six times before they trusted Christ. What if you're the second? What if the sixth time that brings them to faith in Christ comes five years later after they move away and you don't even know it? What if you get to have a reunion in heaven and discover to your amazement that the person you lost touch with and who rejected your witness and was frankly kind of rude to you actually ended up even being a better Christian than you were? And you get to talk about it in heaven. The normal Christian life is to grow up to be a disciple. And it doesn't take much. Again, the witness of the, of the New Testament is as soon as people were saved by Jesus, they started talking about Jesus. That's the natural impulse of love. That's why the text messages are flowing. This place is amazing. We just saw the best movie. Hurry down. It's 40% off. Your stuff is 40% off. You want me to buy you something? Why do we do that? Love. Simple love for the person we're communicating with. Let's, please, folks, let's give Jesus no less. Here's the second reason we should tell people about Jesus. Because Jesus himself told us that Jesus is the only one who can give eternal life. Jesus wants to be known and commands his disciples to make disciples because Jesus is the only one who can give eternal life. I'm back in the Gospel of John. In John 14, right before being arrested, Judas is on his way to get wicked men to capture and kill Jesus. Jesus is talking to his disciples, giving them comfort for the moment and direction for the future. And this is what he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Here's the astonishing claim of Jesus. He speaks for God and with God as an equal. In the same way that you believe God, now also believe me. Look how he talks about God. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? I love Thomas. He gets a bad rap. He's always honest. He knows the enormity of the moment. He doesn't yet sense everything that's going on, but he knows this is huge, and he seems to know that this is final. 
And he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way leading Jesus to, teeing Jesus up to say this enormous truth? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Wow! Many years ago, I fell immediately into one of those airplane conversations that you sometimes have on airplanes and airports where you, with a complete stranger, you immediately get a mile deep. I think that happens because the setting is we're probably never going to see each other. We actually did keep in touch. It got that deep that fast. He told me what he did. He asked what I did. I said, I'm a pastor. And he immediately said, you're very narrow. And... I knew he wasn't referring to the way I fit in the seat, so we talked a little bit. And I quoted this statement from Jesus to him and explained to him, you may be right, sir, but I'm, I'm as narrow or as wide as Jesus himself. I didn't make his claims up. He said, not I know the way or I am a way, Jesus said, I personally am the way, the truth, and the life, and made this astonishingly narrow, exclusive shape, just like him claim. No one comes to the Father except through me, but I have good news for you, Thomas. Since you know me, you also know the Father. You know God himself. That's the second thing we have to always remember in our responsibility and joy of being those who tell the good news. Number two, Jesus is the only one who can give eternal life. He's the one. No one else is coming. No one else can keep that promise. No one else has that authority. And finally, number three, Please remember to tell your friends and your loved ones and strangers when you mention Jesus to them, try to remind yourself that eternal life with Jesus begins now and lasts forever. It's not just eternal life someday. The moment you have Jesus as Savior, eternal life begins with Him and it never ends. And the great joy of being part of this church family and having the perspective that I do as a pastor is that I get all the missionary letters. And I don't know, hear all the stories of what Jesus is doing in this church, but I hear a lot of them. I seek them out. I ask for people to tell me stories. I check on them to see what is happening with them. And I can tell you, with absolute confidence, Jesus is alive and well and changing lives in this church. That's what he does because he gives eternal life the moment you believe him. And it's not just a ticket to heaven someday and go live your life on your own any way you please and I'll see you in heaven someday. No, Jesus who is life gives life. And some of you have been transformed from knuckleheads and twerps into some of the most magnificent Christ-like people I've ever had the joy of knowing. You stick around, you make friendships in this church, you stick with someone as they follow Jesus in a matter of months and certainly in a matter of years, you'll discover that their character, their priorities, their kindness, their love, their patience, their self-control, that all those things that Jesus is perfect in, are improved in them because Jesus not only gives life, He is life. It starts now and lasts forever. Listen to Jesus describe it. Read this with me, John 7, verse 38. Jesus said, Whoever believes in Me, as the Scripture has said, out of His heart will flow rivers of living water. Doesn't that sound amazing? Where did we ever get the idea that the Christian life was this dry drudgery, this dry drudgery, this terrible trudge until Jesus made everything better in heaven? Everything will be better in heaven according to the promise of the Lord Himself. Someday God will wipe away every tear. But it starts right now. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow. Rivers of living water. John 17, verse 3. Jesus 
prayer, one of the most magnificent scriptures in the entire New Testament. If you haven't read it, read it carefully when you get home. It's a long prayer from Jesus, and He's not praying to teach people to pray. He is in deep communion with His Father before He goes to the cross. And He said this to God, and this is eternal life, that they know You, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom You have sent. Eternal life with Jesus starts the moment you trust Him. Life that goes on forever is knowing the God who made everything and His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He sent after us. All of that is available to your loved ones. So think about following the Great Commission as widely as you want, in any way that you can, with whatever your courage, your personality, your temperament, and your loved ones can bear whatever you can handle right now. But please start telling them good news. Let's not waste our lives in talking about good things that will someday end. We have good news to share across point. Let's do it together, telling people about the one who himself is the very best news of all. Let's pray together.